welcome to the Founders Forum for Mesquite Days of 2018. I'm Geraldine Zarati, president of the Virgin Valley Historical Society, and this is part of our program to bring uh, recognition to groups and people who have been here in the Valley for a long time. We've really enjoyed them, and we think that uh, a lot of people enjoy them. It's being broadcast here, besides to our audience here, it's being broadcast and recorded, uh, recorded to access, and it's being recorded right now live to home in the Valley. Uh, this Founders Forum is going to be moderated as usual by Merlin Hafen, and he is going to introduce our guest tonight. So Merlin, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, appreciate you being here, everybody here and everybody who's watching. Also, um, it will be posted on YouTube eventually. So we'll be everywhere. The theme for Mesquite Days this year is empowering our youth. So as a historical uh, society board, we de decided that we would feature um, a group that has done a lot for our youth here in the Valley over the years, and that is uh, the Boy Scouts of America. So we've invited uh, four of the leaders um, currently and formerly and still involved. Um, I don't have the official count, but it's these four represent close to 200 years of uh, Scouting, uh, sc scouting here in the valley. <laughs> of course, Jennifer, you had your, your kids, so uh, that counts a little bit too. But um, anyway, they they have a great wealth of knowledge of what uh, it has, what scouting has done for the the boys and the families here in the valley. And um, we'll be talking about some of that. Uh, first, we're going to start with just introducing um, everybody on our panel. Uh, we won't do any scouting yet. We'll just ask you your names, how long you've been here, family ties to the valley, that type of thing, because uh, some of our uh, history buffs like to, to know that first. So, um, Jennifer, we'll start with you on that end. And okay, hello. I'm Jennifer Tishner, and I've been involved in scouting since 1995, and... I first moved to the Valley in 92 and was here for a couple of years and we left and then we had a chance to move back to Mesquite and we liked living here before so we came back and we've lived here ever since. So I've been involved in Cub Scouts in particular for me since 1995. Okay, good. Um, just a disclaimer, I was Jennifer's husband, Mark, um, Roommate up at Dixie College a long time ago. That's back when he worked on the boulevard, but at the 7-Eleven, not, not as a premier accountant here in Mesquite. But, so we go back quite a ways, too. Uh, Cheryl, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, uh, I moved here in 1976. My husband is from here, and we have nine children, seven daughters and two sons. And um, I substitute teach, and and help the youth. Okay. Kelton? I moved here in 1962. I started my scouts uh, up in Provo, Utah while I was in college there. And uh, I've got a total of 59 years of scouting. Okay. And you were also the uh, woodshop teacher here for Oh, that's correct. And I taught driver's education. And you have, how many children do you have? Four. Four, and two of them are here in the valley? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All of a sudden, uh, Terry, I never see her. Okay. Keith? Uh, I'm Keith Bellap. I moved here. We, My wife and I moved here in uh, 2002. Um, we have five children. They're all scattered up I-15 from here to Montana, and then we have one other one in Ute in Hawaii. He has his come over and tend his kids every once in a while. I've been in scouting since I was eight years old. I don't know if I should say how long that is or not. 
but yeah, maybe I should up that uh, number from 200 up a little bit. Is that? <laughs> yeah. No, we have, a, like I say, a great wealth of uh, knowledge and uh, exp scouting experience here. Um, of course, and Elsabeth and uh, Cheryl has brought a lot of memorabilia here that we'll be uh, talking about uh, over the course of the uh, forum here. But um, Cheryl, why don't we start? One of the main things with uh, scouting is the Eagle Award. Why don't you tell us about um, some of the uh, Eagle projects and, and, and some of the first Eagle projects here, in, or the Eagle Scouts here in the Valley? Well, I counted up, and we have 359 young men that have received their Eagle Award. And uh, out of those, 19 have also received at least one palm. So um, uh, looking back, I've, uh, I have a book of the Eagle Scouts. I've collected pictures of them and a little write-up. Um, some of the projects were building a trail from, in the wash from the LDS church, so um, down the wash. Um, they built uh, tables and a bridge and fire pit at White Rock. They, um, one scout covered the irrigation ditch on Yucca Street. They've done landscaping at the museum. The museum used to be where they held scout meetings, and it has changed a lot. Somebody built, uh, just recently built a new sign in front of the museum. There have been several projects there. Uh, one scout hauled wood for the widows in Bunkerville. He hauled 13 loads in one day, so she would have wood to, for her heating. Another scout collected flags for the citizens to display on their houses. One bound hymn books at the church. Uh, one scout uh, painted Wilma Reber's home. Um, there, there was no map of the Mesquite City Cemetery, and so there was a scout who made a map and entered all the names on the computer and made it a computerized map, and they identified the graves of the, those who had served in the military so that now um, on holidays the veterans can have flags placed at their graves. Um, another scout did a sign at the Bunkerville Cemetery and a map they built, a, uh, they built sidewalks at the Hughes Middle School uh, in addition to what was there to make it more convenient for the students. And another sidewalk was built up at a high school. They built a shot put ring at the high school. Um, another scout identified all of the historic homes in Bunkerville and put signs up so there would be some history of the pioneers in Bunkerville. Uh, another scout put on a talent show, which was up at high school. It brought a lot of the community together. The ticket to get in was a toy, and all the toys were then um, taken to Primary Children's Hospital. Um, another scout did um, landscaping at the rec center. Um, another scout did another sign at the Mesquite City Cemetery. Um, many projects have been done at the elementary Recently, they put up signs um, so that when there's a fire drill, the students could go to the right place and be with their class. So those are some of the projects. Okay, and you have most of them in these? Uh, yes, in the I have um, collected. And there are a lot of good stories in there, too. And, yeah. and uh, Elsabeth, who's also the curator over at the museum, she has her eye on those books. So <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have two books. One I take to the Court of Honors to display, and uh, Eagle Court of Honors, and the other is at the LDS Stake Center, so that when people go there, they can look at the book. Okay, thank you. Um, Jennifer, before we started, you said you had a story about some of the, uh, an old-time scouting story. Could you sure. tell yes, us I'd a little bit about that? Sure, yes, I'd love to share that. I actually found it in the book called Mesquite Flats, A History of Virgin Valley, written by Vincent Levitt in 2004. And in the book, he says the earliest record he found of boys in Virgin Valley in, was in 1926. Ashel Levitt and Willie Eaton of Bunkerville were the, they saved the life of a, a little girl 
that was drowning in the irrigation ditch. And they heard the mother screaming. They were out working in the fields. And so they came running, and they saw the little girl floating down. One jumped in and grabbed the little girl, got her out. She was lifeless, thought she was gone. Um, the grandfather of the little girl was Andy Pulsifer. He grabbed the child and yelled for someone to go get a barrel so that they could roll her over it. To, and Ashel informed the grandfather that he and Willie were Boy Scouts and they were trained by their scoutmaster, Brother Shanks, on the correct method of applying artificial respiration. And after some time and the removal of considerable water from the child, she began to sl slowly began to show light signs of life. The two boys continued working on her, and eventually she regained consciousness. And it says years later, in 1986, at the funeral services for Ashel's nephew, Elwood Hardy, Ashel reported that an attractive lady came up to him after the services and introduced herself to him and said, I understand that you saved my life. She was that little girl from so many years before. So, so on that, you leaders, how many times have you uh, taught first aid uh, merit badge or first aid requirements for the different things? Every year. <laughs> Every year there's first aid or some kind of life, well, for me, not so much life-saving for Cub Scouts, but... Every year, there's something that they that they learn. They they start out young with Cub Scouts learning easy stuff like first aid, how to clean a cut and bandage a cut, and then it gets harder and harder and more in depth the older they get. To where by the time they're in Boy Scouts, they're learning the real stuff like these boys did on life saving practices. Thank you, um, Kelton. For you. Um, when did you first become a scoutmaster? I became a scoutmaster first. I was registered first uh, in uh, 250 at uh, Provo, Utah in 1959. And I went to college there. And... Uh, I just, uh, the bishop came over one time, wanted to know if I, uh, he'd talk with me, and I, I thought, I don't know why he's talking to me. I don't go very often. I live right across the street from the church. I, uh, I started scouts with uh, eight boys at Provo. So we had basically a, pat a patrol rather than a troop, but the kids hadn't done anything outdoors, and so we, uh, I asked them how they wanted to go, knew how to go camping. We was going to go camp at El Wood. And one of the boys says, well, we're putting a tent up on the lawn count. I told him, no, I could just practice. That wasn't going to count for scouts. But... They got so every Saturday I had wanted to do something with those guys, and I wasn't smart enough to get a, an assistant to do that. So uh, I had to just do the best I could and, and take do my lessons on Sunday and the scouts on Saturday. So I didn't go to church that often. Okay. So w when you came here, did you... You were in Scouts when I was in high school. When did you, um, and I believe you were well, some of my older brothers, too, uh, in the 70s? Or? When, I, uh, when I went to Kanab, uh, after I left, uh, graduated, I didn't get involved in Scouts. And uh, I did get involved in Scouts when uh, I came to, to Mesquite to, to teach. And then I've been involved ever since then in Scouts in one way or the other. Okay. And Keith, you say you've been in Scouts since you were eight. Um, I know when you moved here early 2000 or? 2002. And, and what have you done? You've been in, on the district and different committees. Tell I, us a little bit about your. When I moved here, I was, I had been serving, my last assignment was on the 
scout committee in the local troop in Belur, Montana. I'd had some health issues and I was kind of really just staying home. I couldn't go out with the boys. When I moved here, I was here about three months before I got called to be a, the chairman of the scout, local scout committee in the sixth ward. And um, after about three years, I started working on the district committee. I've been kind of doing both of them ever since. And you, you were in charge of all the paperwork. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I was in charge of reg registering all the boys in the in the area of all the boys and the leaders for registration. And then the last couple of years, I've been working with the training of some of the adults, too. So. Okay. Cheryl, did you have some time? Uh, he just received his 70-year pin at the recognition dinner in January. So, 70 years from the national office. So. <laughs> That's a great recognition. Do, do we, does that add up, Keith, then? Eight and 70, is that? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, good. No, we appreciate that. Um, another question we've had, I know we talked a little bit about the, uh, we've talked about the Eagles and how many have had, but also the leaders. Um, uh, they receive, I think, the highest award locally here is the Silver Beaver. Silver Beaver. You all four have received that, haven't you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And do you have a list of some of the others? Maybe. Oh, uh, um, Elspeth will put it here on them. Okay. Uh, we have a plaque with all of the Silver Beaver recipients on there, and it got so full we had. Uh, there's an additional one to hang below. Um, first, though. Um, they receive uh, the second Myler Award, and that's a local award um, for going and doing the extra, <laughs> extra mile. And then um, those that have served quite a few years and, and completed something, uh, some things and some trainings, there's a lot of trainings for these leaders, then they receive the Award of Merit. And we have two plaques with Award of Merit recipients on there. There is, and that is a national award. And they receive um, uh, a bar for their uniform and, um, and a plaque themselves. And then we have their name put on a plaque. And so then um, from those um, people that have the Award of Merit, then if they continue in scouting and they must be a registered scouter, and um, have completed trainings and, um, and participated, say, in, in summer camps and being on the committee uh, to lead the summer camps or, um, or taking care of the uh, Merit Badge powwow or, or the Cub Scout day camp, then some of those things will qualify them to be nominated for the Silver Beaver. The Silver Beaver um, people are nominated and then it goes to um, the um, Utah Parks Council, and the Utah Parks Council then can pick from those. And but they're only allotted so many recipients in each council per year, depending on how many boys are registered. And then um, that is the national award is the Silver Beaver. So we have quite a few in our valley. Uh, um, if I might say also that we used to be part of the, it was first called uh, Boulder Dam Area Council, then it was changed to the Las Vegas Area Council, and we were part of the Las Vegas Area Council until a few years ago, and they decided to move us to the Utah Parks Council, which is based in Orem, Utah. So we are now, um, we used to be the Virgin Valley District, part of the Las Vegas Council, we are part of the Snow Canyon District in um, St. George. So, um, but we have been fortunate, we thought, oh, being, uh, Utah Parks Council is one of the largest councils in the United States. And we thought we wouldn't ever receive any Silver Beaver recipients. But every year, um, we have received um, a silver beaver, uh, somebody in our valley has received the silver beaver um, award ever since we have been in for, um, I think it's two, I know, two years that we have. Okay. 
Um, on that, you were talking about uh, the Cub Scout Day Camp. Now, that was just held last week. Were you in on that, Jennifer? You were? I was there as a leader. There is a leader. <laughs> yep. And how many kids, uh, scouts? Would Usually you we have about, I'm going to say average 100. Sometimes it's as high as 125, but right around that number of Cub Scouts in the Valley at one time. And it's an, uh, that was an, an all-day event, right? Right. We had the Weeblos come on Friday afternoon, and they did three activities. And then they came all day on Saturday along with the wolves and the bears. And uh, we have a tiger group with the community pack, but they're too young to come to day camp. So I'm actually the tiger leader for the community pack. And I do Weeblos for the community pack and the pack 2040, Mesquite First Ward. Okay. What, what were some of the activities that they did? Just tell the audience. Oh, well, I can tell you the Weeblow stuff because that's the group I was with. Mm -hmm. But for we have all kinds of fun stuff that we do. On Friday night, they did their hike, a three-mile hike, and that was for outdoorsmen. We did Cast Iron Chef. They actually did some outdoor cooking and learned about knife safety, hem handling and all knife handling while they're cooking. Um, let's see, we talked about duty to God and what that means to us and set some goals to achieve that. Adventure is what they call them now. Adventures is what they, what they earn. Um, let's see. What else did they do at day camp? Well, they do... Oh, yeah, we always have archery and BB gun at day camp because that's the only time... A leader can't just do archery and BB gun in a den meeting. It has to be at a when we have certified people there. And so we that's the only time the Cub Scouts get that fun stuff is at day camp. So that's a highlight that is, of yes. day camp always. So um, I know my for Weeblos. Um, I know my son, they did the uh, uh, soap carving. Uh huh. And, knife safety. Uh -huh. And then they made the little Pocket toolbox. Knife. Mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff. So he must be in bears. Yes. Uh huh. I think. Um, anything to add to that? Were, were any of the rest of you involved in the day camp this year? I know the wolves. We had three groups of, of wolves, and there were. Um, 13 in two groups and, and 12 in the other one because one boy didn't show up. We built a wooden toolbox so they learned how to use a hammer and nails and fit joints together and seem to have a good time. And, and it was a nice box too. Well, I thought it was. <laughs> It was good, good practical skills for these boys. Um, I'd like to add a few weeks ago up on at Lime Kiln, there was a camp out. Uh, probably about 40 boys um, camped out for the night. They had a program in, in the evening. Then the next morning, there was four different classes of, of fire uh, safety, knife safety, the, the totem chip uh, card, um, knots, and again, the first aid. And uh, again, practical skills that they don't always get. It was out in the mountains, uh, no cell service um, for some of them. Um, they were up all night, most of them. <laughs> so, um, as, so speaking of camps, that that's when they have. What are some of the camps that they do around other camps uh, for the Boy Scouts uh, around here? Um, <clears throat> every year, every other year, they go to Colob. Uh, it is um, a church camp up um, by uh, Colob Reservoir. Every other year they go up there and spend a week. Um, the boys, uh, 12, um, 14 um, through 14, and the 11-year-olds can go and stay overnight and work on their trail to Tenderfoot. Uh, on the other years, each troop um, goes on their own camp. Some of them go to Mapledale. Um, some of them have gone to California um, to the beach, but there are uh, there there's a camp down there. Um, there are several camps um, 
uh, that belong to the Boy Scouts in Utah that they can go to. Um, I had I did go back through the book if you would like to know some mm -hmm. older things that they did. Yes, please. Um, um, the the very first uh, some of the older scouts way back in the fifties they went uh, on an overnighter near the Bunkerville Bridge, and Sam Reber and Grant Reber used a horse and cart to get their bedding and their food down to the bridge. <laughs> The boys rode their bikes down there. <laughs> um, later on, they went to Mount Charleston and had a great time. In the 1970, they went, um, took a trip down to the Grand Canyon. They went on the Kayabab Trail and um, hiked down, and, and they were so tired, they just rolled out their bedding and slept on top. And then they hiked down to Phantom Ranch. Um, <clears throat> one of the most memorable trips that one of them said was uh, their scout leader took them to Salt Lake City to uh, the Tabernacle where they watched the L went in and went to LDS conference. They also said uh, many of them went to Zion National Park and camped out. They went to Pine Valley. Um, some of them did a three-day backpack trip to Zion. Um, they went to Camp Bonanza at Mount Charleston. They went to Cedar Mountain Tubing, went to Lake Mead. I know that my sons went to um, um, Cedar Mountain in the snow, and they always did snow caves. They built snow caves uh, and during the Christmas break. They would go and do that, and how much they en enjoyed that. One of the things that they said that they really, uh, uh, several of them were able to go to high on the mountaintop, at Flagstaff, Arizona. That was about in 1980. There were 30,000 scouts there, and um, Bon J. Featherstone was there, and the scout, several of the scouts wrote in the book how much they enjoyed that. Some of them did a canoe trip down the Colorado. Um, in 1979, they did a 50-miler through Kolob and Zion, but <laughs> they carried they carried canned food on a 50-miler, and they said how hard that was. Today, um, they have all the dehydrated foods, and so it's easy. Because whatever you take on your 50-miler, you have to pack it out also. <laughs> so the scout motto is leave no trace behind. Uh, Cliff Hughes has led the scouts on um, several 50-milers over the last several years. And they have gone up to the high Uentis and gone on a 50-miler. However, to do this, the boys need to be at least 14 and up because it is a grueling trip. <laughs> they have to prepare for it. They have to carry everything with them. So they have to go on three pre-hikes before. So on three different weekends, they go on an overnight with their big pack on their back as if they were going to prepare for this, so they're in shape to go. Um, that's all I can, but they, they've gone to a lot of different camps um, in Utah also. And it always seems that one of the favors is to go up to the mountain and pitch a tent somewhere and have mm -hmm. fun. Uh, you mentioned the river. Yesterday, uh, Aaron had one of his sons and my son. Uh, their leader is Kevin and Tina Jensen, and they ended up at the river and had a great time in the mud, and that's mm -hmm. always a, a big draw for boys and, and scouts. They like to go over to Bunker Pond <laughs> also. <That too>. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, while we're on some of these high adventures, if you can all think of, a, uh, of one that either you've been on or your, your son or, uh, or, or as your leader, uh, some of the a memorable trip. Uh, Keith, we'll start with you. <laughs> I know you've had some in Idaho and Montana, and yeah, I'd, most of, most of my scouting activities outside w outside nature with the boys was in in Montana. The area of the country just south of Glacier Park is referred to as the Bob Marshall Wilderness Area. And uh, we we went on lots of hikes, I probably thirty five, 
50 mile hikes in there with the boys. And we always required that there were at least 14, at least for first class, and that they had their first aid merit badge and were certified in CPR. That was a that was a done deal. If you didn't have that, you didn't go. And so it it made the kids work because we had we had t-shirts and we had a, one guy that could soak screen stuff and so we'd do a t-shirt with it, the first hand deal, second, third, fourth, on so forth. Um, Bob Marshall trip. And then we just we just add a segment each, each time they went. And the kids look forward to it. The parents look forward to having the kids go on it. We had, we had a good time. Uh, since I've been down here, I like I say, I've been kind of relegated to paperwork, but uh, it's, it's just a, has been an outstanding opportunity for me and the boys to get to know each other and to know the program and to do the program and to really gain from the opportunity of being in Scouts. Well, if you've, if you've been on a 50-miler, you've had a great accomplishment right there. So. Well, I think so. Because <laughs> part of getting the 50-mile hike is doing a service project. So part of the time that we're back in the wilderness, we're doing some kind of service project, working on trails, uh, improving camp areas, whatever. You know, and that had to be certified through the Forest Service, so it worked out great. Okay. Kelton, do you have a outstanding trip that you can remember or one that maybe wasn't so outstanding? That Well, I uh, remember the one to the Grand Canyon. It wasn't 50 miles, and we didn't do it in one day, but we felt like they almost had earned a 50 mile every time they carried all their gear through the canyon. But the thing I remember the most is it's high on the mountaintop. I, they ask us to bring a, a, a flag, mine to the staff. And they had one uh, evening where all of us went there, carried the flags, and then he posted the flags all in that area. And then they had uh, different uh, scout leaders uh, address us. And to, to look out there and see all of those, those flags in this area there, was something that I don't think I'll ever forget. Okay, thank you. Cheryl, how about you? Well, my sons remember high on the mountaintop the most. They have still talked about that. And that was in Flagstaff area? Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't, uh, 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 my oldest son, Bo, went to uh, Philmont. Um, Ellis Cheney took several of the older boys, and that was a really memorable experience for him. They went, um, they went backpacking through the trails. They didn't just stay at the base camp. But, and then they got a tour of the Phillips Ranch House, and, and uh, they let him play the piano. That's what he remembers. <laughs> but, but he did like the, um, they did some rock climb, rappelling there at uh, Philmont. That was a great experience. They were gone all week. And, yeah. Okay. Jennifer, how about you? Well, I actually got to go to Philmont. My husband and I took our family, and we did a camp for a week at Philmont. And uh, best family trip we ever took. As a matter of fact, my little Cub Scout Bolo guy that I have right here, I got him from attending Philmont. So he's one of my prized possessions. I love him. But I have to say, um, I just lo love everything about the, I just, I'm a Cub Scouter. I do Cub Scouts, and I love everything about the program. I tell parents that it is everything a child needs to learn that sometimes as parents, we don't take the time to teach them. So if you get them to Cub Scouts, we're going to have a great time, and they're going to learn stuff that they need to learn. And we learn duty to God, duty to country, service. My favorite adventure that I do with my Weeblos is called Aware and Care, and it's about being aware of people with disabilities. And um, I always take them up to, well, I've gone to a couple of places, but my, my recent one, we took them up to Highland Manor, and 
and let them visit. I have a lot of friends up there that I go visit. And so I took them up there and let, let them in, see what it's like for people who have had a stroke or who are blind and have different disabilities. And, and it opens up their eyes and makes them aware of those kind of people that need our extra help. And of course, I love Pinewood Derbies. We do Pinewood Derbies uh, in Cub Scouts every year. And a um, lot of fun outdoor activities. We teach them healthy eating. Just so many fun things. I had to learn how to cook um, outdoor cook. Cast Iron Chef for Weeblos is Dutch oven cooking. I'd never done it before till I became a Weeblos leader. I had to learn how to do it. And um, we've made some pretty good things. And I've just really had an, just, I love, I love, love doing Cub Scouts. I do Tigers on Tuesdays and Weeblos on Thursdays every week. Okay, anybody out there that has kids that age, sign. <laughs> we'll post Jennifer's number so you can give her a call. But no, it, it is good. Uh, one of the um, stories I was going to tell, um, I wasn't in Scouts, but I'd been asked to pick up this group of Scouts. Uh, Matt Reber was the um, Scout leader and, and Jim Andrus, and they had been down close to Payson, Arizona. I can't remember the name of the camp. I was to go down on a Friday, and then we were coming back with a load. I was picking a load of boys up on Saturday morning. We were to travel back. Well, Friday there was a fire, and that was we didn't have cell phones, and so I drove down, saw that they were, you know, they were evacuated. Didn't know where they were supposed to go somewhere else, but they started to come back. But I had missed them. They waited in Flagstaff, and since there was no place to stay, we drove all the way home on Friday night um, so we were uh, I was on the road a long time but then so were those scouts but they had got everything and just moved on out so sometimes those things happen too um, Aaron do you have any did you do scouts up there in <laughs> no? okay um, we have a few things that we will uh, show of the Elspeth and Cheryl brought from the um, Museum, if there's some things that you could show and Aaron will uh, spotlight in on. And then while we're doing that, if, if you can explain it, uh, Elspeth, and then our panel will be thinking of anything else we can wrap up with. Believe it or not, I'm good. Yeah. Believe it or not, we have one of Calton's uniforms here. This was his scout shirt, um, and it has the patch on it. It's uh, Boy Scouts of America, Boulder Dam Area Council. So, did you know it was there, Calton? <laughs> you did. I put it in there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> along, along with the Cub Scout cap here. Also, we have a uniform that belonged to Ed, si um, Dan, and Kim Cyphers. So, if you like my family, the uniforms get handed down until they, <laughs> they <laughs> you take the patches off, you put the new ones on. But this particular uniform belonged to um, Dan and Kim Cyphers. And I remember uh, when Robert, my youngest boy, who's now 24, was in Weeblows. He went to, I think it was Cheryl. And he and um, Alex Moriarty were best of friends at that time, and they wouldn't miss Cubs for anything. So um, let me see what else we have. And I am coveting this book here. You can see it's pretty thick. <laughs> but this is the 300 or so Cub Scouts Eagle Scout projects that have happened over the years in the valley. Um, you've got Keith Reber, you've got Eric Jim Hughes. First person in this book is Bert Levitt. Correct. Followed by Jimmy Hughes, the first mayor of Mesquite. So that's kind of interesting to see where, where scouting can take you. And then Joe Buller was right after that. Is was he number three? Yep, he was on? number three. Mm -hmm. Um, over the last three years that I've been coordinator at the museum, 
We've had a number of Boy Scout projects, um, Eagle Scout projects, and the latest one that we've had was done by Keaton Ogden, who put bird feeders and um, bird houses in the backyard. It has brought a lot of birds to the back of the museum, but not only birds, we now have a fair old cat, we have a couple of hamsters, or, yeah, hamsters, and we also have a bunch of lizards that we didn't have before. So it's increased the, the wildlife in the backyard of the museum. Um, one of the first projects that I had was done by Lane, uh, not Lane, Omo Flores. He was desperate to do his Eagle Scout project, but left it until the last two weeks. So he came up with a project that would take him two weeks to do and managed to succeed. One thing I really admire about the young men that come into the museum is how they put it together. I don't, when they come in asking, have you got a project for me? I give them, a, I keep a small list. I give them a, something off the list or they choose something off the list and then it's entirely up to them. They, like with Omar, got his done in a couple of weeks. Um, Lane, who did the sign, he decided that that was his project when he was 14 years old. And since his dad said he couldn't go to prom unless he finished it, it took him two years to do it, but he did get to go to prom and <laughs> after he finished his project. Um, I can't think of anything else offhand here. We have a number of old handbooks in the museum that date back. Um, Bear books. Uh, this is probably our oldest one. It's a handbook for boys. But the cover's gone, so I can't give you a copy there. <laughs> oh. This is what, how much influence scouting has on people. I do not know if you can see this very well. If I put it... Does that work? Okay. Um, this little piece of basket weaving came into the museum via Lowell um, Bunker. Lowell Bunker was a uh, Boy Scout, uh, let's see, it would be 50 years ago. And his leader had taken him down to the river, someplace to go, to find arrowheads. And all the boys had been looking for arrowheads. Everyone was having a pretty good search except for Lowell, could not find anything. So he went up the bank a little bit, start digging around, and he found this little piece of basket weaving. And he was really disappointed because he hadn't found an arrowhead. So he took it to his leader, and his leader told him, you have something very special. Very special, and it's more precious than an arrowhead. Lowell, took that to, Lowell um, Bunker took that to heart, went home, put it in a t wrapped it up in tissue, and put it in a Kodak fo um, film box. He toted that round with him for 50 years. So on one of his last trips back from Provo back to California, he dropped into the museum and handed me the little box and said, I think this needs to come home. And so all those years he had remembered what his cub leader had told him. So I think the leaders have a profound influence on the young men that they teach, and I'm really glad that they're here. Okay, thank you, Elspeth. Good stories. Um, we'll do a. Well, actually, Geraldine, do you have any questions? Well, I, uh, of course, she does. I just, I just don't think enough credit is given to scout leaders because what little brush I have had with trying, you know, with scouting, which has been with the real young, with the young, it's a lot of work. And for the scout leaders through the years, the effect that they have had on the young people, the young men in the valley is just amazing. Because I have heard the stories of what life-changing experiences these young men have. On their, fi their 50 milers are kind of humbling. <laughs> it kind of breaks them down and then it builds them up. And it's just the work that I, I really, it's kind of a thankless job. I, it's probably thanked in that you get to see the effect. You get to watch these young people grow into fine young men. And uh, it's just, I, I just think there's just not enough praise for scout, scout leaders who give their time all these years of working with the young people. Uh, are there any questions from the public? We have a microphone here that could... 
I could I could tell you a few words from this for that the uh, Eagle Scouts have told me about how it affected them. They I have tried to get them to write how scouting has helped them, and um, one a lot of them has said it helps me learn to when I start something I need to finish it, I need to complete it. Um, it taught me work, how to work, how to give service. Uh, the Scout Oath and Law have become the foundation of my life. That was a quote. Taught me to work hard. And uh, a lot of them mentioned their leaders and thanked them for all the time they spent, for all the campfire programs. They said the campfire programs at night meant so much to them. Um, they knew that their leaders really cared for them. They knew their leaders had commitment, and the young man learned to respect and have loyalty. Um, one, uh, one scout said, uh, eagle, doing my Eagle project and doing my merit badges has taught me to think for myself. It's taught me skills of how to fix things so I don't have to hire somebody to do things for me. But they all uh, thank their leaders um, for all the time they had spent because it does take a lot of time. The young men have to have 21 nights of camping and only one summer camp counts towards that. So if you get five nights at summer camp, you've still got 16 not camping nights. And so the, the leaders take a lot of their time, not only off work to go take them to summer camp, but then um, they've got to go Friday night and take off early maybe from work and be away from their families to, to go camping all of those other nights. So. And uh, we appreciate um, all of the merit badge counselors and give a lot of their time, volunteer a lot of their time in teaching the young men these skills. And a lot of the Eagles have uh, found their life's work because of doing a merit badge and, and learning those skills. So. I was, I was going to mention that too. Uh, it was probably about a month ago uh, at a merit badge class, Judge Ryan Toon taught it up at the judges at his mm -hmm. in the courtroom and it was citizenship in the nation uh, there is over 30 boys um, you know in the evening he did a great job it was over almost two hours that he had their attention got most of it done and that besides besides what he did they had to write a, a letter to their congressman or senator mm -hmm. that type of thing but but that so many of these people volunteer and and help out the scouts. Another thing I want to mention is, is you look at the book, um, most of those Eagle, well, all of those Eagle projects has been something for a group or an orga organization in the community. Um, one of them that comes to mind is the, Lauren Reber did a, a um, fence around the garden, the heritage garden across from Casablanca. Um, very professionally done. Again, a lot of the leaders were there to help and, and uh, help the boys, but, but the boys did a lot of the work, most of the work. Um, saved the garden thousands of dollars, uh, just on that one example. Um, then Nathan put up a, a flagpole. A lot of the flagpoles you see around town has been an Eagle project too. So, so they learn how to work, and again, and they're taught by the leaders, so it, it's a great program. And, and back to the theme of empowering our youth, it certainly, it certainly does that, so. They have to um, learn leadership skills and um, when they do their project, because they have to oversee it and see that things are done. They plan it, and they get an idea, then they plan it, and they have to write it up and go before the Eagle Board to get it approved. And if they approve it or help them make changes, um, um, then they go out and do it. And they have to, they have to either fundraise or get uh, donations for the project. Yeah. And then they go before the board again and present it. And they get a letter from the entity that they helped. It can't be for the scouts. Their project can't. It has to be for the community or school or a church group, the whatever service they're doing that uh, they do have to show leadership skills and that helps them a lot in their life um, also filling out the application process um, and that is a real pain for some boys but I think oh what a great thing they have learned 
They're going to be able to fill out job applications <coughs> exactly. and yeah. know how to talk to adults because some boys, it's hard to talk to adults and um, they learn to be more comfortable presenting, pre making a presentation before an Eagle board. Yeah. Um, Keith, you had a... Well, I think something that's kind of overlooked too is the fact that even the boys are organizing this and, and they try to do it as economically as they can. So a lot of the... They get a lot of the things donated for the projects, and I think we we really owe the business people in the community a good a great deal of thanks because these boys have been supported so well over the years that I know of. But for example, there's been a lot of free concrete donated. <laughs> yes, you know, and that kind of thing, and, and that adds up to a lot of money when you look at the total number of scout projects they've had but most of them it's with donated materials and that's really good i think and jennifer you had a question a comment i i do i was reminded of a story um when you talk about leadership skills for when they become boy scout age and eagle whatever but in weeblos in cub scouts we have an adventure called building a better world and a few years ago, um, I was going over that with one of my boys, well, one of my, my Weeblos group, and they had to identify an issue in the our city that needed, that was important to them that could be make our city better. And uh, my one of the boys named Ethan Richards, he came up with the idea that this city doesn't have a bike park and we talked about um, what they can do to make a change. And so he came to the city council and he got up and he spoke to the city council and said, we need a bike park for us kids. And from him learning that adventure and how you can, you can make your, wherever you live a better place, he came and, and the city council worked on it and got it approved in the bike park that's across the street from the rec center is because of that adventure, us working on it and talking about being a leader and go, you can do it. This is what we're supposed to do as citizens. So that was a fun story for me to remember just now. Yeah, that was good. Okay, any questions then, last chance? Um, any closing comments from our panel? I have a question. Oh, we have one question. Eagle. I think, Cheryl, did you have uh, that number? We have 359 as of now. And uh, I didn't explain about the palms. 19 of those have received at least one or more palms. A palm represents five more merit badges than um, the 21 required for Eagle. Uh, so some of the boys, and you can get as many palms as you want. The first one is a bronze then a gold, and then a silver. But you can keep uh, getting them. We have one scout that has earned 65 merit badges. There are actually 152 merit badges that you can earn. So there are 21, you have to earn 21. Of those 21, 13 are required, and you have to do the 13. But then you can choose on the others what you want to do. Questions? Ask Sam how many eagles he has. And I tell my grandkids that I can't fly like an eagle, but I can like a crow. Thanks, well, but, but you have three boys and a few grandsons that have eagles, so. Okay. Well, oh. I just, want to, I just want to leave with you that the original aims and purposes of scouting that was outlined by Lord Baden-Powell were to teach boys and young men spirituality, self-reliance, service, leadership skills, emergency preparedness, and conservation of natural resources. So those are the things that we try to teach them. That's our purposes as leaders. And you do a good job of it. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Anything else, Marilyn? That's well, we want to thank our guests. I mean, and I, I wish there were other ways of honoring you, but it's I'm so pleased to know that some of the boys actually thanked you. That was that was good to hear. So we want to thank you for everyone being here. And this is Mesquite Days, a lot of things going on. We have uh, our annual Bake Off tomorrow at 5 o'clock at the Senior Center. That's what we're doing as a Founders Forum. So thank you. Good night.